On April 4, 1977, the largest flood on record for the Tug Fork Valley struck the southern portion of West Virginia. One of the hardest hit counties was Mingo County, with damages estimating over $100 million. Initial estimates from the Red Cross indicated 6,900 families were left homeless and 400 businesses had been heavily damaged or completely destroyed. In Williamson, the county seat of Mingo, the water reached an estimated 57 feet, 30 feet above the flood stage. The flood's impact left citizens in shock and grief, but the ensuing days turned to fear and uncertainty as the disaster left countless of people homeless and downtown businesses out of commission. One such business heavily damaged by the surging waters was Hurley's Drug Store. It was a terrible disaster for uh, all the citizens of this, not only this area, but up and down the river. And of course, uh, uh, I was practicing pharmacy at the time, my partner Nick Maridis and I, and the night uh, before the flood, we were here in the drugstore, and we were concerned as to whether water would come into the store. So we went in the basement, picked up a lot of our drugs, and, and we had a lot of uh, uh, liquid medications in gallons. We came and put it on the fountain. We have a fountain here at the uh, Hurley Drugstore, and we put it on top of the fountain. We figured we may, maybe a little water get in the bottom of the door. Well, next day the, water, the uh, flood hit, and there was over 10, 10 feet of water in the drugstore, and, and er, just about every business in town. Er, everything was totally devastated. We lost our businesses, and but a lot of people lost their homes, and it was very difficult for them to get uh, back into their homes. Uh, back then, it was HUD that came in, and, and uh, now it's FEMA that try to help you. And they had so much federal bureaucracy as trying to put a, they wouldn't let you put a temporary trailer in your yard because it was in a floodplain. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it was just unreal. A lot of people said, uh, uh, we had three disasters, first the flood, then the mud, and then HUD. But you know, a after a while, everybody worked together, people got their homes cleaned up and fi found a place to stay temporarily. But we did lose a lot of our population, a lot of the elderly and uh, people close to retirement age, they just decided to leave the area. Shortly after the flood, residents of the Tug Valley area banded together in order to prevent future flooding disasters. In the spring of 1978, an Amtrak train departed from Williamson and traveled to Washington, D.C. Mingo citizens marched on our nation's capital to address the congressional delegations on flood control measures. We went to Washington and talked. To, we wanted to bring it to the attention of our legislatures. And of course, Senator Byrd and, and Congressman Rahal both were very, very helpful in this. 
and uh, we went up there and uh, we set up quarterly meetings with Senator Byrd. He'd have like the Corps of Engineers in there. He'd have uh, FEMA after they, they were established or HUD, whoever we needed. And finally a program was developed where we did get some flood control measures in this valley. Flooding has been as much a part of Maitland's history as the Hatfield-McCoy feud and the coal mine wars of the 1920s. In 1974, a United States Army Corps of Engineers planner described Maitland as having the most severe flooding problem in America, an observation made before the catastrophic flood of 1977. Like Williamson, Maitland's downtown business district was nearly wiped out. Founded in 1919, even the long-lasting Ninny's department store could not withstand the rising waters. We had had maybe eight or ten floods prior to that, but it was never in the store. It was right under the floor. But they said what happened was the, uh, all the coal mines up there had all those, what do you call those, sludge pods and everything. I think a bunch of those broke loose, I think, because all at once it come this little slimy uh, black water, you know, and, and it went 12 feet higher than it had ever been before, see. When you stop to think, they really didn't do that much for us. Uh, then they come in with the $3,000, $3 million. I hate to talk against all this stuff, but you know, I'm just telling you the truth. The grant money that they give us, $3 million for the, for the uh, because we were considered a, a historic town and because the shootout took here and all that stuff. That's all well and good and everything, but when mom and I decided, dad wasn't living in, mom and I decided to let them go ahead and do it. So they tore out all the back, put all them old timey fronts back here. And they threw out the front and put all them old timey and the materials and everything that they used, they're rotten away already. I had to replace some of the floors and everything because they don't, they use uh, third rate uh, wood and everything, you know, they don't, they don't really use the, the best stuff. I mean, they put windows in all my building and they're all falling out. <laughs> and the windows was in there, was in there for 50 years and they were still there. See what happens? And you, you've read enough stuff on the government to see that. Uh, you know, when they do remodeling and fixing everything, that uh, what they usually do is they charge you hundred dollars for a commode seat, you know, all this stuff, and they get it. That's there's nothing you can do about it. That corruption has probably been back as far as Adam and Eve in it. <laughs> <laughs> After several days of steady rain, the river began to rise more quickly than ever. Due to the rapidly rising water, many were unable to get their property out of harm's way. Nearly every personal automobile, including unsold models belonging to make one's two new car dealerships, was lost. What had in previous floods been considered high ground was now underwater. You know, because of the flood and all that money was poured in here, into here, and all it's like a new store. My store, my store done a fifty thousand dollars more business than it was doing before because of the new store. You know, and you know, what's the old saying? A new broom sweep cleans. Once you got a new store, everybody's just curious, and they we did good business, and then it started going downhill because your suppliers were disappearing, you know. If they could have stayed and, and continued to help us to be there, uh, we'd probably all of us survive, but you can't do it today. You know, we got a $50 million flood wall. When they did that construction, they killed the town. Traffic couldn't get in here, couldn't get out. The customers got used to going somewhere else. It never did come back. And I told them, I said, there's nothing we can do about that, guys. That's just killing us at the council meeting. I said, that's the end of that. But, uh, uh, it's just one of them things, that's what happens. Once you change people's habit, if they're used to buying somewhere, or going somewhere, or a familiar face waited on them or something, and once you change that, it's hard to bring it back. We never could bring it back. So we lost that big time. The town of Kermit sits on the northernmost border of Mingo County. Since it is downriver, Kermit was the last town to get swallowed by the rising waters of the tug. The flood waters did not crest until 55 feet, 17 feet above the flood stage. As a result, the record flood waters devastated the small town community. Some of the businesses never did recover, really, because uh, it was just, I think the IGA and, and uh, Byron Thornton and uh, there was a bunch of them left, you know, never did, never did recover. I tore my house down in 84 and we had five foot of water in it in uh, 77 and you could the mud you could see the line where it was caked in it was just nasty and i know the, all the national guard was in here and it was it was just it was pitiful it really was the national guard they were in here i'd say they they probably had uh, 50 or 60 
men in here, men and women in here, uh, uh, helping clean up and big trucks and end loaders and and I got in back in my house real early, too early really, and uh, they came to help me and I was already back in the house living. I think three days I was back in my house, but. We we we'd had a hard time if it hadn't been for the National Guard and everybody helping us. People don't realize if you fly over Williamson right now, the flood walls on both sides of the river, and we've not had a bad flood since then, because it's just like a dam almost, and it backs the, the water up toward Turkey Creek up Stone that way, and that, that's really helped us. The flood wall in Williamson has helped the town of Kermit really. Oh, it has, definitely, because we lost, you know, the railroad lost a lot of uh, 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 locomotives and trains back then. They never did disclose how much our losses were. And then, you know, Massey was the big employer down, uh, during that time. They lost a, an awful lot of money in, their, in the mines and equipment, and, uh, you know, they went to other areas to mine. And, of course, the railroad rebuilt, I mean, they but they, they were never as strong in this area as they were in the past. Everything changes, there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to go with the flow. But uh, it kept getting tougher and tougher. And uh, we lost A, we lost Wendy, we lost, how many did we lose? I don't know. Over the years, they all had to close up. Yeah. This wasn't nothing out there for us anymore. Companies were just not there. Well, I think a lot of businesses never will really recover. And you know, we don't have much land around here unless it's right on the river bank. So that that's, hurts us more than anything. You know, little by little, people start getting their lives together and uh, we, we had a sense of normalcy.